Now, I'm getting ready to launch in October of 2018 uh, with uh, my cosmonaut commander, Alexei Chenin. And as you can imagine, this is the culmination of 43 years of life's hard work. You know, a childhood dream is, is about to be achieved. So we launched out of the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan uh, on a Russian Soyuz uh, launch vehicle, a Russian Soyuz spacecraft. My family was fortunate enough to be able to make the flight to the other side of the globe to watch me. So my children, my wife, who's also a family in fact, uh, my parents, my brothers, their wives, everybody was there. Exciting time and uh, a gorgeous day. Not different, not too much different than the weather outside today. Uh, clear skies, light wind, and strap on your rocket and get ready to go. So on that day, things didn't go right, but it turned out as good as it could have, and I ended up back in the arms of my family. So what happened? So we were about 30 miles above the surface of the Earth, going about 4,000 miles an hour, and the external booster decided to, to not uh, propulsively separate. There was a damage sensor and it speared into the side of the rocket. The structural integrity of the rocket was lost and then it lost control, started coming apart. And at the moment that that happened, the fairing that our spacecraft was tucked up underneath inside, the rockets pulled us away from the, uh, the center stage as it continued to come apart and go towards, towards space. We were pulled to safety and basically lofted up uh, to the top of our trajectory, just like if you were going to toss a ball up as high as you could. And uh, we got up to about 95 kilometers and then started coming back down. And then at that point, uh, I got to experience my landing, uh, which was parachutes deploy, uh, land on the ground, and uh, pararescue uh, forces jump in to get us. This is a picture uh, from the space station of our launch in its failed uh, attempt to get to the space station. Alex Kirst took this, so you can see us kind of continuing to arc up to the edge of space. So, gotta say, seeing a smiling face of a Russian pararescue jumper uh, looking through the window at me as I'm looking at him, and he's waving, and they roll uh, the capsule over and pull us out. It was a, it was a pretty big relief, uh, and you know, it's uh, it's I can't say. I can't express in words what it feels like to go through something like that and then come back and be able to, to hold your wife. Um, so this is risky business. So why do we do this? Why would we agree, my wife and I, agree for me to strap on another rocket five months later and try this again? Because what we're doing up there is important. The science that we're conducting on the space station is opening up humanity's understanding of the world around them, of themselves. It's allowing us to improve life on the ground, and it's allowing us to go deeper into space so that we can answer some of those more difficult questions. So it's important. So we accept those risks. It's important, the station is important because it's this unique place 
where we can do the types of research that, that you can't do anywhere on the face of the earth. So we have to do it in space. So it's important. It's important because it's international. You look at the faces of the crewmates that I had up there, my Russian cosmonauts, my Canadian astronaut, the Italian astronaut, or the, the first astronaut from the UAE, the first Arab astronaut. It's international in that it brings us together. It's this positive mission where we, the search of understanding of, of the world around us pulls humanity together in spite of whatever complexities there are on the ground. We have this common interest. And so it is this, this mission up there of this, this cooperative pursuit of, of knowledge. So in a nutshell, it's all about the science. Whether it's, and we've already heard about all of it, but you know, whether it's 3D printing human tissues or it's, it's sequencing DNA and trying to edit that DNA and seeing what effects there are, whether it's seeing how it affects the human you know, physiology being up there and weightlessness and how that might allow us that understanding to go deeper into space. All of those things, it's about the science. I'm up there for 350 days, or I'm sorry, 203 days, 350 different types of scientific investigations while I'm up there. And truth be told, you might think, oh wow, he's gotta be really smart to know how to do all that stuff. The answer is no. Two thirds of those I never saw or knew a thing about until I was on the space station. So I didn't spend years training for this stuff. It's the hard work that the team at the, at the national lab does to integrate everything on the ground so that when you launch it, you can let somebody like me, who's never seen it before, run through the procedures and work hand in hand with you to accomplish this groundbreaking science. So it's a team approach. Wow. Okay, so. I'm going to talk over this. Oh, cool. I show this because this I want to really demonstrate sick. to you the uniqueness you, of the space station environment. There's a lot of different ways to talk about it, and, and you know, my colleagues have come up here, and they've been very uh, scientifically precise in how they describe it. I wanted to use something a little more fun. OK? <laughs> so this is, this is vanilla and chocolate pudding. So everything that you understand or every, everything you take for granted about the world around you, when you get up there and you see gravity go away, it changes your perspective. Everything you knew is different. We've all been eating pudding since we were this tall. But when have you ever thought, well, let me just squirt this all into the air and then I'll just eat it a little bit at a time out of the air. You don't think that way, but up there, the impossible becomes possible. Up there, the things you've never even thought about questioning, you can question and then try to find answers to it. So it is a unique environment. An example of something not so fun, I you know it's fun to play with, but it's not so silly, I should say, is Astrobe. So we talk about robotics. So We've long been looking for how we can use robotics on the station to help augment what we can get done because we talked about crew time being this precious commodity and there's only so much time in the day and so that's, that's the limiting factor. So how do I have a, a robot that can help me out? How do I have a robot that can put eyes over my shoulder so that the ground doesn't have to have me move a camera and spend 10 minutes moving a camera around? So think about the challenges associated with this. It's a free-flying robot inside a volume where what's on those walls changes on a daily basis. What's on the ceiling, what's on the floor, everything is constantly changing. And so it's having to learn its environment and figure out how to interact with people like me to get its job done. And so that's just one of the ways that we're really trying to take, take microgravity, this idea of gravity going away and okay, now how can we apply what we think we know on the ground to the situation up there? And this is going to help us with what we know about robotics on the ground, but this is really going to open it up for us when we start going to the moon. So the Artemis program and the gateway and getting back to the moon and learning what we need to learn on the moon so that we can push on to Mars, we're going to need robotic assistance. We're going to need this type of technology to open that up. We use robotics all the time on the outside. You've got the Canadarm uh, that you know, I got to fly 
So if you can imagine the human perspective of human spaceflight and, and, and trying to do this. So we practiced, I practiced hours and hours over three or four years on how to fly this robotic arm, how to capture a vehicle, to reach out and snag onto a grapple fixture on this vehicle uh, under any condition that it might throw at me and how to do that safely. And then when the day comes, you get one shot in 90 seconds, go. <laughs> so don't make a mistake and everybody's watching. Needless to say, my heart rate was a little accelerated. But that's just one of the ways we use robotics on the outside. Now, one of the other ways is we might get to fly on the end of the robotic arm. So we might have a crew member on inside moving the robotic arm with a crew member on the end of it on the outside. So we can get into a place to work on this, this facility that's the size of a football field. And the perspective, you know, you got to say the perspective really opens your eyes. You go out there and you're wearing your own spacesuit. This is my personal spacecraft that has everything I need in order to survive. The only thing that I have a connection with the space station is if you can see the braided steel cable that is my safety line back to the airlock. Otherwise, everything I need to survive for seven hours outside is with me. And so you feel like you're flying around in your own spaceship. And the visor provides you so much of a field of view that the suit melts away and you're just out there working shoulder to shoulder with your crewmate talking to the people on the ground, working through all your problems. Getting everything done that we need to get done. What did we do up there? We were expanding the capabilities of the station. We were changing out the batteries for the solar race so that we could extend the life of the station. We were putting on a new docking adapter so that we have the ability to put commercial crew capsules on the front end of this in multiple ports. So we're continually expanding the capabilities of the station so that it can still be there performing this mission for years to come. And you know, we've been up there 20 years now doing this. So that's, that's us at the end of our first spacewalk. And I say our first spacewalk because Anne and I had never done a spacewalk before. David and Christina had never been on the space station when a spacewalk had been done before. None of us had seen one happen. So we were all rookies going out for a spacewalk. And so how does something that complicated happen, and how do you do it successfully? Well, this is the tip of the iceberg, right? I said it's a team, and so there's four of us up there, but there are tens of thousands of people on the ground that are supporting us making this happen. And so you've got the control rooms around the globe, whether it's Houston or Huntsville, Alabama, or up in Canada for the robotic arm, or in Cologne, Germany, or in... Moscow, or in Tokyo, or just outside Tokyo, all of these control rooms are constantly in contact with us, helping us through all of these difficult things. So we don't do anything on our own. In fact, we rely on the ground to do 95% of the job. So when I think back to my time on the space station and all those hours of doing work, and living up there. One of the highlights to me is, is represented by this picture. And in the, in the science, you know, here we're, we're looking at, in, in particular here, we're looking at re bone re regeneration and wound healing. So that's, that's of importance to everybody on the ground. But the science at this point kind of melts away from me and it becomes more of, well, what does this symbolize? So I spent hours inside that glove box. I'd never seen that equipment before. I didn't know the science behind what was going on but you can see the earpiece on my ear. And so it's the team on the ground, it's the principal investigator that I get to talk to on a daily basis and interact with and ask him, you know, hey, what's, what's the, what principle are we trying to get at here? What's the question we're trying to answer? How can I help you do this? I have the privilege of being their hands and eyes and ears collecting the data but I realize that's all I'm doing. I'm collecting the data. We're a team, and they're the ones that are going to have to take that data and learn from it. And so these conversations and being part of that team and interacting and overcoming challenges with the hardware and, and finally getting the job done, it's those interactions with the team that I find most rewarding when I sit back and I think about my time up there. And so my challenge to you is, you know, why, 
how can you be part of that team? How can you work with me the next time I'm on orbit? Because it is something magical to be part of when you think about what we're doing and the potential impact that it could have. All right, I talked about work. So let's talk about living in space. So I'd be remiss if I didn't share a little bit of the living experience with you up there. So meals were an amazing time. Meals were a chance to, you know, just relax a little bit. The work days are long. They're 12 hour days, five and a half days a week. So you get little bits of time after the, you know, the end of the work week to, to sit back and have a crew, crew dinner. And it was a chance to get to know your crewmates even better, to listen, listen to their favorite music, whether that was Italian disco or Russian traditional songs or American country western. We got to appreciate each other's music and languages and culture and, and really live that international aspect of the space station. It was also a chance to get creative with the limited ingredients we had on board for what we can make with our food. So you're looking at, at taco night, and I think that's Tabasco sauce and salami. I don't know. <laughs> but you, you work with what you've got. And they were special times. A big part of living up there is exercise. So we are floating around in microgravity, and so I'm not using my muscles. I'm not using my bones to support my weight. And so all that stuff will just wither away if I don't do anything. And so two and a half hours a day, I have to work out every day. And so part of that is aerobic. And so you can see there's the, the treadmill, which these elastic bungees keep us to the ground. Um, just like on the, on the ground, when you're running on the treadmill and you get tired and you step off to the side and it keeps counting the miles, well, you can do that on orbit too, but it's a little easier. You just lift up your legs, the treadmill <laughs> keeps going, and the miles keep counting. Or, or riding the bicycle, you know, a stationary bike up there. But notice if you look underneath, I'm not sitting on a seat. I'm just pedaling away. I've got a little waist belt to keep me from floating and rotating forward, but I don't have to support my weight. And then there's lifting weights, which is the other half of the equation. So how do you lift weights on orbit? We actually have two gigantic metal syringes that we pull a vacuum in, and that resistance from drawing that vacuum is how we generate the resistance uh, on the bar. And so we lift weights every day. And I'm happy to say that that countermeasure, we're still learning all kinds of stuff about the human body, and we've got so much more to learn. But from a strength perspective, from a cardiovascular perspective, I can land on the ground and I can stand up. I'm, you know, I'm not weak and, and feeble. I may not be able to balance and I'll fall over immediately, but at least I'm strong. There's other you know, things we do to live. You know, it's, it's service rivalries, so Drew's my crewmate. He's still on board the station. Um, he's an army colonel, so we, you know, the service rivalry, uh, whether it's watching a, you know, football game, we've got the ability to, to pipe up live TV or at least one channel of live TV when we've got satellite coverage. And so you can watch a, a college game. Alexei in the top, he's calling his family, and that's something that we've got to do uh, every week is do a video uh, conference with our families so that you could see your children and see your wife and, and, and try to stay connected. We could also just call on you know, an IP phone anytime during the week. Um, haircuts, that's one thing they don't train you on, surprisingly. <laughs> the first one is a little dicey, and then it gets better. And, and then life continues, right? So you know, I celebrated a birthday. We celebrated lots of birthdays, anniversaries, national holidays for the different countries, uh, you know, births, deaths, life continued for seven months while I was up there. And so we as a crew celebrate all of that together. Uh, and it really generates this, this environment, this space culture where all those differences that usually we use to differentiate us are the things that we end up celebrating the most. Because we also acknowledge all of the similarities. And there are far more similarities than differences that draw us together. And because we recognize that connection, we're able to celebrate those differences and, and not have it pull us apart. It's a, just a very magical place. But probably the single most 
the single thing that I did the most up there was looking out the window. And so the cupola, in our view, outside the station and the perspective that that gives. In one view, you can see so much. You know, this is just looking to one side. Photo out the cupola. I can see the whole Nile. I can see all the Middle East. Think of the scale in just one photo. And it's right there. I see the geology. I see the, the major geographic features. I don't see a whole lot of country boundaries. I can see San Diego all the way north to Vancouver. Or in South America, I can see the Andes stretching as far as the eye can see. And the earth is just so amazing at what it presents to you. And we're going around the earth every 90 minutes. And so every 45 minutes, the sun is setting or the sun is rising. So you get 45 minutes of daytime and then 45 minutes of nighttime. And there's something just amazing that happens when the sun sets. Because I've been staring at this blinding earth underneath me and my eyes have closed down. And then the sun sets. And I, all I still see is just the horizon and maybe the brightest stars that you can see. And then slowly my eyes open up. And over the course of five minutes, the depths of the universe are revealed to you. You know, all these stars start appearing out of nowhere, and you get this sense of how big it really is, and how the earth is just right below us, and that's what we've got. And there's so much out there. Yet the, the only place that I know of where stuff is living right now is just right below us. And it just it challenges your understanding. You can see the upper atmosphere glow as it interacts with radiation. You can see the northern and southern lights. They dance like ghosts on the horizon. You can see, while I was up there, I was, uh, Hurricane Dorian happened. And so you can see the immense power of Mother Nature just the raw destructive power, and it looks so peaceful. It's like this fluffy white pancake laying on top of the earth, and it's got this eye that you can take photos of, and you can see right down in the middle of it all the way to the, to the ocean, and it's just mesmerizing how it looks like it's still, because we're going over so fast that all the apparent motion of the, of the hurricane is gone, and so it's just sitting there, and it looks calm, and it's, it, it, but you know underneath it that it is just destroying everything in its path and that anybody in its way is in harm's way. And so you see that. You also see the enormous potential for destruction that humanity has on its environment. So this is a picture of South America and you can see the enormous swaths of deforestation. What was forest is now no longer. You see home. So for me, this is, the, this is the front range in Colorado. Kansas is over here. My birthplace is over here. I graduated high school there. <laughs> so there's no place like home. And you feel that connection as you fly over things that you knew and you're familiar with, and you're able to pick out those features, even though to you guys it just looks like there's nothing there. You may be able to pick out features here. Or if I zoom in a little bit. We were actually in downtown San Francisco this morning. Drove south on the 101 to get here. <laughs> Traffic was light. So it, all of it changes your perspective on how you view the world. And for me, it just seemed more precious, more delicate. And it was all laid out right in front of me. And I could have stared out the window for another 203 days. Uh, but unfortunately, the mission comes to an end, and it's time to come home. And so I landed, very much similar to the first time I landed, out in the middle of the Kazakh plain and uh, under parachute. Only this time I was able to come back with Hazza Amansuri. I mentioned him before, the first Arab astronaut. 
and you can see Huzzah, Alexei, and, and I calling on the sat phone in the middle of what everyone would consider nowhere in Kazakhstan, calling home on the sat phone to my wife and going, I'm home. Because your perspective of home changes. When I was leaving, this is the picture I took out the cupola window my last day there because I was like, I need to remember what this view is like. And so I snapped it. I'm so glad that I did because now it means so much, so much more to me because I know right now that there are two astronauts and a cosmonaut staring out that same window looking at that same view, that the mission continues, that it's going, and it's going to continue to go. We've been doing this for 20 years. We're going to continue to do it for years ahead. The science, the process of discovery, the ability to, to push the boundaries of what we know, it's going. And the question is really, Who's going with us? Do you have ideas that we can explore up there? Because you've got crew members that are excited about making that a reality. You've got a team on the ground that's excited about trying to make that a reality, questioning things you never thought you could question. You know, when I look back to the arc of, of my full story, you start with that launch, the risk is very apparent based on what happened but standing here today, I can tell you that it is absolutely worth that risk, what we can gain by discovering together. So I'll show you, because eh. when we discover together, where are we going to go? Back to the moon. So the Artemis program is going to take us back to the moon. And and we need to do it together.
We accept the risks because we believe in what we are doing. This is an important mission. We are trying to open humanity's eyes, discover new things, make life better on the ground, and push further into the universe. What's next? Artemis. Oh, thank you.